Okay, why don't we get started? I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Matthew Price. He's a colleague of ours from across the street in the Department of Psychological Science here at UVM. He's, been, he's an assistant professor. He's been here since 2013. He received his undergrad degree from SUNY Binghamton, his master's and PhD from Georgia State University. He's a clinical psychologist. He primarily conducts research on the use of technology in the treatment of trauma-related disorders, including PTSD. And this work uh, requires interdisciplinary teams, and he collaborates with a number of other fields, including computer science, trauma surgery, and neuroscience. He's been funded by the NIA, the APA, and the VA. So thanks, Matthew. We look forward to your talk. Thank you. And thank you all so much for coming. I feel like, oh, yes, this is on. Can everyone hear me OK? Great. Well, thank you all so much for coming. I know that the weather sort of gave us a should I or shouldn't I. So I'm happy we all chose to come today. So I'm excited to share some of the work that we've been doing here at UVM since we started here, as well as some of the things that have been going on in this field of how do we sort of understand and begin to treat individuals who've experienced a traumatic event and what I'm calling the acute post-trauma period, which is sort of this, uh, this period of time that happens shortly after a traumatic event occurs. I should start by saying that I am a consultant for the Vermont Oxford Network, although none of the work I'll be sharing today uh, involves any of the work that I do with the Vermont Oxford Network. So, um, exposure to traumatic events is fairly common amongst American adults. Uh, this is the most recent estimates from 2013, and at the end of the day, when we think about what type of trauma, uh, how many people have been exposed to a traumatic event, about 89 to 90 percent of American adults will at some point in their life experience a life-threatening traumatic event. And we define a traumatic event as an event that as results in actual or threatened death, physical injury, or sexual violence. Um, so these events, unfortunately, are fairly common. Uh, and they place people at heightened risk for a range of mental health problems. One of the most commonly studied mental health problems is post-traumatic stress disorder. And post-traumatic stress disorder is a good disorder to think about after a trauma um, because it's a very broad and heterogeneous diagnosis, which allows it to encompass a lot of the problems that people experience after they've encountered a trauma. This figure over here on the right shows us sort of the prevalence rates of individuals who've experienced uh, PTSD, uh, after they've experienced a trauma. And fortunately, these numbers are fairly low for those of us that have experienced just a couple of uh, these types of traumatic events. But you can see that it's, trauma exposure is cumulative, meaning the more type of traumas you've experienced, the more likely you are to go on to have a significant mental health problem, namely PTSD, after a traumatic event. Overall, we guess only about 8 or 9% of the population will have PTSD during the course of their lifetime. But again, that's sort of a, a misnomer because the amount of trauma one experiences in their lifetime can be is, is a quite a significant risk factor. When we talk about PTSD, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'm referring to the DSM-5 diagnosis, which kind of cuts across five main criteria. Criterion A is the actual traumatic event. And again, it's an event that involves actual or threatened death, injury, or sexual violence. And I think the threatened piece there is important because one could theoretically go through a very frightening experience in which they are physically safe, but there was a a tremendous risk that they would be very seriously hurt, and that would still count as what we would call a Criterion A event, and I may refer to the term Criterion A event throughout this presentation. Then there are four sort of symptom clusters of the types of problems that result that people commonly experience who have PTSD. Uh, criterion B, which is the persistent re-experiencing of the event through flashbacks, through cued reminders. Uh, effortful avoidance of cues or things that might remind them of the trauma, an alteration in the way they view themselves and the world, generally a view that the world is not a safe place and that they are not able to handle the dangers that are present in the world, and then a sustained arousal or reactivity. These are folks who tend to be very, very quick to jump uh, if they should hear a loud noise and sometimes take a long time to come back down to a baseline level. So, this, so we, before we talked a little bit about how the prevalence of PTSD looks over the course of the lifetime, but let's sort of look at what the prevalence of PTSD and mental health problems look like after people experience a traumatic event. PTSD is a very unique disorder in that it includes an actual uh, inciting event in order to be diagnosed. And so that sort of sets up a timeline from which we can say how many people develop the problem from that particular point in time. And the best data that we have comes from, from a study that was done nationally in the United States as well as 
uh, one that was done throughout the Australian, New Zealand healthcare system, and we find that about 31%, about a third of those individuals who experienced a traumatic event, <laughs> at uh, one point, uh, a year later point in time, they will have some type of diagnosable mental health problem. Um, for the majority of these individuals, that will be their first mental health problem that they've ever had in their lifetime. So it is a risk factor for new mental health problems. A good chunk of these individuals will have PTSD. A good chunk will have depression. A good chunk will have substance use disorder. And truthfully, we could probably extend this figure all the way out to include every single disorder in the DSM. And exposure to trauma is, again, just a big risk factor for a range of mental health problems. And PTSD is a helpful one, partially because it does sort of encompass a lot of symptoms that we would see in other disorders. And so this kind of presents uh, both a, a, a challenge to our, our healthcare system in that individuals who are exposed to these traumas, one third will have some type of mental health problem a year out. But it also suggests that the other side, two thirds, will not. And so it begins to beg a question of should we be intervening shortly after a trauma if the majority of people are not going to have a mental health problem? We have precious few healthcare resources. And so is it make sense to sort of put forth, uh, try and tackle this problem when um, a, a good number are not necessarily going to have a mental health problem? And it begs the question of two of that, well, maybe those folks who have a mental health problem uh, will go off and find treatment on their own. And we don't need to worry about providing them early intervention or, or intervention in the moment. Um, and for those of you that have worked in this field for more than probably a day, will know that that is not something that ever happens. Um, our best estimates, again, of how many people with a mental health problem in general are in treatment is only about 41% of, of people are, uh, with a mental health problem are getting services. It's a smaller number if you look at the number of individuals getting services from a dedicated mental health provider. And when we look at uh, traumatic injury patients a year out, only about a third of those with a mental health problem are receiving services, and the majority of those individuals who are receiving services have also suffered a traumatic brain injury in the course of their injury. Um, and the reason that we're talking about a TBI, uh, and, and that's notable because when you have a traumatic brain injury or a TBI, you generally get a lot more services, a lot more evaluation, a lot more people laying eyes on you. And so the likelihood that someone's going to make a referral for counseling or therapy is much higher. Um, those of you who don't have a TBI after an injury, it's a much, much lower percentage. And then this last bar I always put in there is just a tongue-in-cheek uh, of the number of patients that I've seen referred to the clinics that I've worked in across my career um, is 0% that have been referred directly from a trauma center for a treatment for a mental health problem. So this is just to say that the likelihood that individuals are going to go out there and receive treatment after a trauma who need it uh, is fairly low. And so it would make sense for us to think about how we can intervene shortly after the trauma. And I should say that I'm not the first person to think about this. Uh, there are a whole range of really excellent review papers. Here are some of the citations for a bunch of them that talk about this idea that, boy, if we could intervene early and prevent some of these P uh, uh, PTSD and other mental health problems from occurring, that would be really helpful and really potentially beneficial. Um, and I should say, too, that I... Um, that, that, that this sort of leads us to think about two primary questions. One, who do we treat? Meaning, when we think about the, the, that only a third of these individuals are going to potentially need treatment, how do we identify who's at risk and who's not at risk for a problem that we should be targeting? And then secondly, how do we treat them? What interventions are we going to use in this acute post-trauma period to provide some type of intervention? And I go, should go on to say that this is not a new question. This is not a new problem. Um, in fact, if we go all the way back to World War I, which is arguably when PTSD was first starting to become something that was uh, understood by the larger medical community, namely in the form of shell shock from soldiers, who, from combat veterans who were serving in World War I, there was an effort to try and find ways to prevent this problem from occurring. And some of the first early interventions that were uh, attempted were prescriptions of milk and lobotomies. And I can safely say those interventions don't work. So for all of us that are getting uh, CEUs for this, hopefully we'll at least walk away knowing that milks and lobotomy should not be provided for, as an early intervention for PTSD. But this is just to say that this is a, this is a problem that's been uh, in search of a solution for quite some time. We fast forward to the more modern era, an early intervention that gained a lot of popularity in the late 90s and then sort of came to prominence around the 9-11 period of time in the early 2000s was something called 
critical incident stress debriefing. And I mentioned this intervention here uh, only to point out, sort of provide a PSA, that this was uh, very well studied. And the overwhelming majority of evidence suggests that this is not an intervention that we should do. It could potentially provide no benefit, and in some uh, unfortunate cases may uh, increase symptoms. And I think that it's, I put this uh, abstract from the Cochrane Review, this excerpt, uh, because it's so rare to see uh, the empirical literature be so clear on something, uh, compulsory debriefing, debriefing of victims of trauma should cease. You know, it's very rare to see such a, a clear, uh, definitive statement about what we should do, but here that, that's about CISD. And a more appropriate response could involve a screen and treat model. The idea that we could potentially assess patients multiple times and then get them into treatment. So uh, someone decided to do that. Uh, Arya Shalev at NYU Medical School and colleagues uh, did just that. They developed a project that they called the Jerusalem Trauma Outreach and Prevention Study that was done through Hadassah Hospital um, in Jerusalem in Israel. And the idea was that they would identify patients who are in the emergency room receiving acute care services at Hadassah Hospital uh, and then follow up with them at multiple points in time. They first checked in with them within a couple of days of their, of their trauma. They then called them two and a half weeks later to see how they were doing. And then those of them that were still symptomatic, they asked to come in for an in-person assessment that occurred another two weeks later. They then reevaluated them. And then those that were still seemingly to have elevated symptom levels got referred on to treatment. So it was sort of this successive number of steps uh, to try and evaluate who is still at sustained risk over this first six weeks of time. Those folks who were still at elevated risk for, for, prop, for, met, for PTSD were then randomized to one of four conditions, prolonged exposure, which is an evidence-based intervention for PTSD, a cognitive therapy protocol that has also been shown to be efficacious in treating PTSD, uh, uh, receiving an SSRI or a placebo intervention, or just assigned to a weightless control. And then they administered these interventions over the course of 12 weeks and then checked in with them again to see how well they did. So what did they find? Well, they found that uh, overall there, there was some strong, compelling evidence that the behavioral interventions, the prolonged exposure and the cognitive therapy, were very effective in treating PTSD symptoms, as shown by these two lines right here. The weightless control, the SSRI, and the placebo all follow this upper line. They kind of all lay on one on top of one another, which would suggest that prolonged exposure and cognitive therapy may be useful this early period of time. SSRIs may not be useful. This SSRI result, I should say, has mimicked other uh, intervention studies showing with, with more de fully developed cases of PTSD that shows that SSRIs are questionably effective um, in treating PTSD. So we seem to find those findings here. This figure over here just shows that when you treat the um, folks who are on wait lists, which is over here with prolonged exposure, their sort of rate of change kind of meets up with where the people who got prolonged exposure initially were. So again, some evidence that giving behavioral interventions early on uh, may be helpful early on here defined as in the um, first months or so after a traumatic event. And the effect sizes they got were quite large. For those of you that are fans of effect sizes, as am I, uh, we find that the Cohen's D was about 0.93, which is a, a very large effect size. and would suggest that this might be a very effective strategy. And so we might say that this uh, problem has been solved. And we could end this presentation early and all go home, but not quite. Um, uh, Dr. Shalev and colleagues, I give them a tremendous amount of credit because they also published a companion paper uh, about their particular study after publishing their results. And their companion paper sort of said, let us tell you how it was to actually do this process. And what they, f and this uh, figure, this table here, I'll sort of walk you through it. It sort of just shows you how many people they reached out to and how sort of, how many people they sort of lost along the way getting to the point of randomizing people to one of those four intervention arms. And what they found is that they, uh, uh, they were uh, 1,500 people that they got to the point where they said, you should come in for in-person evaluation. Remember, the evaluations are screening in the hospital, telephone call, invitation for in-person assessment. 1,500 of the 5,000 plus people that they screened got to that point where they said, you should come in. Of those people they invited in, only half actually attended that in-person assessment. 
of the people that attended that in-person assessment, only half were thought to be worthwhile to refer to treatment. And of those that were referred to treatment, only about three quarters attended treatment. Now, you know, th th depending on whether uh, these 50 percent numbers really, I think, are a good test if you're an optimist or a pessimist of is that a good number of referrals? Is that not a good number of referrals? But what their, their point was to say is that we lost a lot of people sort of going through this pipeline. And they uh, put in their conclusions and their abstract that despite successful outreach, many symptomatic patients declined care and subsequently recovered less well. And so this screening and treating may be helpful only um, for really exceptionally traumatic events. And so they said that, that even though this strategy seems to be effective, the implementation is very burdensome. And so we should think of other strategies or continue to look for ways to um, solve that problem. So perhaps it might be helpful for us to start bedside treatment. I think I flipped that around, start treatment at bedside. Um, and so uh, colleagues at the University of Washington, Douglas Zatzik and friends, um, decided to do just that. So they developed an intervention that would begin in the hospital. They still use a, a very brief screening process. So they identified people through the hospital census that might be candidates for developing PTSD because they, they experienced a criterion A event. They had a research assistant or a social worker meet with that individual, give them a self-report measure uh, twice within a couple of about, within a period of, about, of at least five days. So quick coming in, doing a 20 question survey and then leaving. To, and then those who were elevated on that screener twice well, were deemed to be at elevated risk. And so then they began their intervention. And so this sort of really titrates down the screening process into a matter of days, usually when people are still within the hospital recovering from their serious injuries. So uh, they're easily, more easily accessible. Although anyone who has done this work knows that those who are in the hospital are not necessarily super easily accessible. So what did they use to treat them with? Well, they invented a model that they're calling collaborative care. And collaborative care begins with, this, with the question of, of all the things that have happened to you since you were injured, what concerns you the most? And then what, what about this worries you and how concerning is this for you? And then the interventionist job is to help try to address and problem solve around that most significant concern. A good example that Dr. Zatzik offers about what this may look like is he tells a story of a patient that was in a very serious car accident with her son. It was a mother and a son. And the mother was rushed to the adult uh, tra trauma services. The child was rushed to the pediatric services. This was uh, years ago before cell phones were so common. And uh, the mother was when the mother was uh, released from surgery, she obviously was very distressed about what had happened to her son. And so uh, she was asking the doctors you know, what happened, and they weren't sure. The collaborative care interventionist came in, and the intervention there became a telephone. Let's get her to be able to talk to her son in the pediatric wing. Collaborative care person was able to um, make that happen, and uh, mom with symptoms uh, distress in that moment went down a lot. And that is sort of the idea behind collaborative care, sort of what that looks like. So is this an effective way to help handle these uh, PTSD symptoms? Well, the answer largely is yes. That. Uh, over the course of a 12-month follow-up period, we find that the people who got collaborative care, which are these uh, lower lines here, showed less PTSD symptoms, although those who fought usual care sort of uh, improved over the course of time as well. The effect sizes here are a little bit smaller, 0.32 and 0.34, but still in the modest range that makes this sort of a tr an attractive intervention. And so this potentially is a, is, a, is a good way to intervene with individuals after they've experienced a traumatic event cuts down on the screening process, and potentially seems to be a little into, easier to intervene with. Um, well, you know, not quite. Uh, they also say that, well, this intervention went on for a full year. And care managers spent a median of 13.2 hours with each patient over the course of that year. And 13 hours over the course of a year is certainly a drop in the bucket when we think about how many hours there are in a year. But if you are a hospital administrator and you are trying to pitch a systemic change to your uh, higher ups in the administration that we should do this intervention that requires 13 hours approximately per patient, um, well, if we have a thousand patients per year, a thousand patients per year in our hospital that would screen into this intervention, that requires us needing about six and a half uh, full-time staff members to successfully do this. And you can see how that starts to become a problematic point 
um, when doing this intervention, and it's not uncommon for level one trauma centers in major cities to have over 50,000 admits a year. Um, I did some work in Atlanta, and the level one trauma center there does about 100,000 admits a year. So you can see how this sort of becomes a problem of scale rather quickly. I know in talking with Dr. Zatzik, he's mentioned that this has been sort of a challenge in talking with the powers that be um, in uh, protocol design of uh, they just can't seem to spare the manpower to get this done. So the next question is, why don't we start an intervention that's very time limited then? Why, you know, instead of doing, working with them for a year, why don't we work with them for a short amount of time? And so Dr. Barbara Rothbaum and colleagues at Emory University uh, try to use that. And I should mention that I am one of those colleagues here. Uh, so I, the study is near and dear to my heart, but we will be objective in our discussion of it, just as we were with the last. Um, so the idea here was that rather than sort of do a long-winded intervention that would take potentially uh, a year to implement or, or, or complete, what if we did three sessions of an evidence-based intervention that has been shown to be effective at treating PTSD, namely prolonged exposure? We, prolonged exposure is typically done over the course of eight to 16 sessions, but you could modify it so that it could be done in three. First session would start right there in the hospital, so we're beginning our intervention bedside, and then they would come back in for two more weeks after the fact uh, for the following two sessions, and then they'd be done. And so uh, would this potentially be effective? So this was done at Grady Memorial Hospital in downtown Atlanta, again, with a level one trauma center, and uh, what we found is that it was effective. Individuals who got this intervention showed a decrease in symptoms over the course of uh, one month follow-up and then three month follow-ups with effect sizes again of 0.38, 0.34, which is comparable to what we saw uh, with Douglas Zastic's collaborative care intervention. And this seems to be potentially useful. Um, a challenge though is that when we look at for whom was this effective? Uh, the emergency room and the trauma services is a very diverse service where you have a range of people coming in with a range of problems. What we found in our particular study here was that victims of sexual violence benefited tremendously from this intervention. Intervention is in the gray bars, uh, assessment uh, only is in the white bars. Whereas the people, victims of transportation accidents, car accidents, motor vehicle accidents, and physical assault benefited less so. And the question becomes to see is that is this an intervention that is time consuming and also requires a, a hefty amount of manpower, is this an effective way to intervene with individuals uh, given that it seems to work better for some than for others? And so, you know, we think about it broadly about um, where we are with the state of the science of how do we sort of do early intervention for people who've experienced the trauma. Um, you know, we know that we want to treat individuals who seem to be, have elevated symptom presentation, who seem to be on a course for uh, more significant problems. But we're having a hard time identifying who those folks are sort of in that early time frame. And then how do we treat them? Um, you know, early interventions are based on very established treatments. And we're, in my opinion, we were trying to take a lot of what has been done for the chronic PTSD patient who's had PTSD for 10 or 15 years and shoehorn that into the person who might have PTSD but has been just injured in, for 10 or 15 hours or 10 or 15 days. And so, you know, we also see these smaller effect sizes and so there's still more work to be done here. And so, you know, I, went, I began to think to myself, um, you know, I wonder uh, what the course of PTSD looks like. What do sort of those symptoms look like? What does the presentation look like of someone who's going to go on to develop PTSD? What do they present like in those days and hours and weeks shortly after a trauma? Because if we had a better idea of what their presentation was, perhaps we could better treat those symptoms that they're presenting with. So I went to the literature, as any good uh, scientist practitioner should do, and I found a range of really wonderful studies that sort of do this beautiful tracking of where they get patients at the time of a trauma, and they follow them over a longer period of time, and they sort of see how their symptoms develop. And these figures may be hard to read, um, but you can kind of just see that they're sort of just tracking symptomology and PTSD diagnostic status over a period of time. The point that I want to call out is in the red boxes, which may be a little hard to see, but what's in those red boxes is the time scale. These studies occur over the course of years with assessments taking place after several months. So while we have a very good understanding of what symptomology looks like as it develops over the course of months after month after month, uh, 
we have a very limited understanding of how symptoms develop in the days and weeks after a trauma. And so it can become a little tricky to figure out how do I treat day two of what's going to become PTSD uh, when all I know is what month two or year two looks like for those who have PTSD. And the other point I wanted to highlight about these figures, again, there are, um, what this figure over here is showing is diagnostic status. So we have on the top people with no PTSD at zero months, three months, 12 months, 24 months, people with some syndromal PTSD, and people with PTSD. And what you may see is there are a bunch of arrows going across over time, and there are some numbers under those arrows. And I know it may be hard to see those numbers, but the important thing to know is that those numbers are there. And what those numbers suggest, tell us is that diagnostic status slides around. People who at one point in time were, did not have PTSD did at the second point, and at a later time point, and those who did have PTSD at one time point did not at a later time point. And so it seems to suggest that the evolution of these symptoms, the evolution of this impairment, is a process that's unfolding. And we want to under, try and understand how, what that process looks like at its very beginning, shortly after the traumatic event, because that might hold some pretty important keys for how we can go about treating these problems down the line. And so I was talking with, uh, uh, so as I say, this leads to this idea of um, PTSD as a model of failed recovery, the idea that after trauma, everyone sort of has a stress reaction, but uh, those who go on to recover uh, do fine and they don't have PTSD, whereas another subset does go on to have PTSD. And what we're interested in is in this circle right around the trauma, what does that process look like? And I began to really think, like, we should really, how come we don't really understand this? And um, I was talking with uh, Jim Hudjack, who's, in, who's here at UVM, and he said, if you're trying to do something that you can't find anything in the literature, it means one of two things. One, you are a genius, and no one has ever thought of this before. Or two, a lot of other people have thought of it before, and it's just incredibly hard to do. And you often hope for the former, but more often it's the latter. Um, and in fact, that's true. If we, you know, as I mentioned at the very beginning, 90% of individuals will have experienced a traumatic event, which means that many people in this room, unfortunately, may have experienced a traumatic event. And if we think back to that time, we can probably have a good understanding of what it was like in those first days or weeks after we've been through this very stressful experience. And the idea of someone coming in and talking to us about a research study in that point of time is very aversive. And in fact, uh, there's been some great work done on this that sort of shows what are some of the challenges that people experience in the acute post-trauma period? It ranges tremendously from physical health concerns, from psychological health concerns. People are worried about getting back to work. People are worried about their social networks and their support networks <coughs> and have legal concerns and legal questions. And then how are they going to do the many, many uh, interventions that they're told to do for their physical health recovery, physical therapy, and all those other things it prevents a real uh, a range of challenges. And so the idea that someone's going to come in and say, you know, we want to do a research study and we're going to check in with you on top of all the stuff you have to do, it's just very aversive. And so the, really, the, the reason I believe that we don't have a lot of good information about uh, the acute post-trauma period is that it's very hard to unobtrusively interact with individuals um, when they are having the, during this very busy time. And so how do we do that? Oh, I'm getting a message on my phone. Someone is trying to unobtrusively interact with me during a very busy time. Ah, perhaps that's a solution. Um, it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mobile phones provide us, have given us you know, a, a beautiful window to sort of get a, a brief glimpse of how individuals are doing when they are otherwise during a very busy time. Um, and we know uh, data from the Pew Internet Technology Research Project, which is a phenomenal site for looking at this information, shows that you know, nearly everyone owns a cell phone. Um, and smartphone ownership, uh, which is this line right here, is gradually increasing. Last year was at 77%. I'm sure it'll be probably over 80% over at this point after this year. Um, usually we find that it, it doubles or it has a huge new jump every time Apple releases a new iPhone. Go figure. Uh, and this figure, this table over here, uh, just shows that the uh, ownership of smartphones and cell phones really cuts across very nicely demographic uh, and, uh, <laughs> barriers and demographic uh, uh, statistics where we otherwise normally wouldn't we see some challenges in accessing individuals that may be from underrepresented groups. They also own cell phones. They also own smartphones. And uh, as a colleague at uh, MUSC told me once that, you know, these types of smartphones are, 
are aspirational devices, meaning that people really want to own these things. They want to uh, make sure that they work and they're functional. So they're, they will prioritize making sure their phones are active and on and working um, above other basic needs, knowing that sometimes people will pay their phone bill instead of paying their power bill because it's more important to have cell reception and cell connection than it is to have lights on in your house. Just keep that in mind. So with this knowledge in hand, uh, we began to think, well, perhaps we could use our mobile devices to get a sense of how individuals are doing after a traumatic event. And so this was back in two, circa 2012, 2013, when that smartphone ownership uh, rate was a little bit lower down. So the prospect of using um, smartphones was potentially a bit of a, of a tough hill to climb. And so we thought, perhaps we could text message with individuals. Perhaps we could use texting as a way to assess how they're doing, send them a message, how are you doing a particular symptom domain, and they send us a text message back. And that would give us some nice insight into how they were doing in that period of time. So we worked with uh, Dr. Samir Fakhri at the Medical University of South Carolina, who's in charge of their trauma surgery division, and uh, found a way, we built a, an automated text messaging system. So every day at around 7 o'clock at night, text message would go out, and uh, the person would send their response to us, and we would capture that response, and it was an automated system. Uh, I checked the messages each day just to make sure there were no high-risk behaviors uh, sent back in the content of the messages, but otherwise it was completely on its own. And this was just a small pilot project with the goal of saying, would people be even open to this given the range of problems that they have after a trauma? So it was a small pilot study. We ended up just with 29 individuals who were able to um, interact with via text. And what we found was that the majority of folks who we texted at least texted us back once, about 83% of the sample. The majority of the sample uh, sent us back a, at least one response. Um, the average response rate was 63%, which is so we sent text messages for 15 days. So that's about nine out of the 15 days we got a response back, um, which I think is a, is, is a good amount of time given how uh, difficult and how challenging this stuff was. And we were only able to send out one message, so if they missed that notification or they didn't check their phone or they just ignored it, uh, we couldn't sort of remind them to do it again. And the response rate, uh, about 40% uh, of the sample or so responded to over 75% of the messages. So a good number of people responded well. And they liked it, too. Uh, a good number of individuals found it to be very helpful, and we asked them a month out. Um, most felt that a text was fine. For one text a day was fine, although a handful said, you know, you could have sent me more messages per day. And um, people thought they were really well. And the nice thing to say, too, is that I was the one who was running the study entirely on my own. Um, so I was the one who was meeting with participants, checking the messages, and then doing the follow-up interviews. And it took me roughly 35 minutes per participant to sort of check their messages over the course of a month and then do a quick one-month follow-up. So it's a much lower burden on the provider end to sort of use these automated mobile intervention systems. And the other thing that we thought was kind of interesting is that we told folks, just text us back. We, we said, the question we sent them was, uh, how much are you bothered by intrusive memories about your trauma? One to seven, one not at all, seven extremely. And just send us back a number. Uh, but you can send us back more info if you want, just, but just a number is sufficient. And most people send us back a number only, but a handful sent us some other stuff. Um, along with it, talking about sort of, you know, oh, seven, today was a rough day, or six, today was better than yesterday. And we sort of had these one-way dialogue with, with these participants because we never responded back. It was all automated. It was a robot sending and receiving these messages. Um, and we just checked them again to make sure there was no uh, suicidal or homicidal uh, intent inscribed in any of these messages. When we followed up with people about this, they said, you know, I really felt like I had someone to talk to it about it. I felt someone wanted to check in with me. I really felt like I was getting something from this process, which I thought was kind of interesting because this is, you know, and, and we were very upfront about that, that um, this is not a, a 911 service. This is not an emergency service. Please do not treat it as that. If there is an emergency, you need to call, you know, go through the proper procedures on the front end. Um, but it had resonated with these folks. And so we were also very excited um, at the idea that we would be able to see what symptoms look like in this sort of early acute post-trauma period. Um, but unfortunately, the robot uh, didn't do its job so well, and we encountered a number of technical difficulties with how it, it sent out messages every day, but the messages that it was supposed to send out got confused, and um, ultimately didn't get really usable data on that front. 
Um, and I spoke with uh, Saul Schiffman, uh, who is one of the fathers of sort of this uh, mobile data collection, and he said, yeah, 80% of projects fail because they have technical errors when they use technology data collection. So let that be a, mind, uh, a mindful note for those of you uh, doing research out there when using these. Um, so uh, sort of felt sort of okay, but someone has also sent me this message of, you know, keep in mind that success is often, is rarely linear, uh, and so persist uh, where if you, if you encounter some barriers. And so we did. And so when I started at UVM, we uh, began what we called the Mobile Assessment After Trauma Pilot Project, which, by the way, uh, abbreviates to MATP. And my name being Matthew Price, that creates a really weird acronym. Um, we'll talk about that at a later point. <laughs> so now this is starting in around 2014. So smartphone ownership is much, much higher than it was back in 2012. The benefit of working sort of in uh, technology-based spaces is that the technology is always improving and changing. So if something isn't capable on today, in about a year, it very well could be. And so the idea here was to see, can we use a mobile application to sort of interrogate this uh, acute post-trauma period? And so the idea was we would meet with people here uh, on Baird 6 and Baird 3 in our trauma center, trauma recovery unit, put an app on their phone, check in with them for a 30-day period. And because we're using a mobile application, uh, we can actually get a little bit more data. We asked them 11 questions. We did an abbreviated uh, post-traumatic checklist, which is a validated measure um, to assess PTSD symptoms. We asked them a question about sleep, a question about pain. And then we also, taking a, a page out of the collaborative care playbook, we also asked them for their current concern as a free test, text response. Uh, things were all voluntary, so they could completely uh, opt out of this if they didn't want to. They could skip any of these questions if they didn't want to. Although, I think we have about a 98% a response rate for the free text, which means that when we sent people a message and they completed our survey, they were also extremely likely to type in a quick word or a note to us. Some people wrote us um, short essays, which was kind of exciting to see that people were so open interested. Uh, other folks usually put in just a, a quick note about pain, back, so on and so forth. <coughs> and because we were using an app and a more sophisticated si uh, system, we could send them a reminder. So we sent them an initial notification to do the survey at around 7 o'clock at night. And then an hour later, if they didn't do it, we were able to send them another notification say, hey, could you do this? And then we, um, they had about 14 hours to complete it, which is about roughly until the next morning, at which point the assessment went away so we wouldn't uh, potentially confuse which day they were doing, uh, they, were, they were responding about. So I should make a quick note here that I'm about to share data that we're still working on analyzing. So take this all as preliminary and just be mindful of that as we go forward. So uh, we got a much larger sample size than our previous 29. Uh, we enrolled 139 individuals. We previously recruited about 30 individuals who did not have a smartphone just to make sure that those folks um, weren't any systematic differences between those who happened to own a smartphone and those who didn't. Um, of those 109 individuals that were invited to complete a survey, 90, 90 people did. Uh, we had a pretty decent follow-up rates at one month time and three months time. Um, so we were able to check in on how they were doing after the fact. This is a histogram of just the responses that we got. Uh, so the y-axis is the frequency of responses. This is days since their traumatic event. Um, Many of these individuals that we recruited were coming through the trauma surgery service. So that means that they were injured to the point that they needed to be rushed in for surgery and then often spent several days in an intensive care unit, at which point it was in, they were either uh, not able to provide consent and we couldn't access them. So our ability to get data from them the like day one, day two after their trauma was limited. Usually by day five, which is this bar, is when we were able to start to interact with them and get them enrolled in the study. And so that's why you have sort of this lower end here. But for the most part, people were very responsive over the course of this uh, particular project. And I, the, the point I want to highlight here is that we had some super users, some people that we told them after 30 days, you can stop. You can delete the app off your phone. And we had the app send them their own notification that said, you're done. You can stop if you want. But a hefty number of people sort of kept going. And so we even had some people that went all the way out for about you know, four months here. So there was something to it for a subset of people that really liked this. Our mean response rate was about 24, messages, 24 survey responses out of 30, which is pretty decent, um, with some variability around that. 
And so this creates some sort of some missing data. So I'm going to show some uh, figures in a moment. And I want to just highlight how we sort of handled the missing data. So you get sort of a patchwork data set that looks like this, where you have, say, four participants. And on day one, you have a response. Day two, you have a response. Day three, you're missing. But then day four, you get another response. And then for day two, you get this. For participant two, you get this, and so on and so forth. And so what we are doing, and this is common practice in this field, is you sort of aggregate these data. So we take the average of their four days and call that sort of period one. And that sort of gives you a, a sense of, of how that person was doing or how your sample was doing um, over a given four-day period. It's sort of necessary to handle um, the large amount of missing data that's just generated by these data sets. So with that in mind, we can sort of look at over the course of a 10 four-day periods, which would be uh, day about day 5 to day 45, this is sort of what overall PTSD symptoms look like. And so this scale is from 0 to 32. So this starts at 4 to 9. So it's a relatively low levels of PTSD symptoms that are in the overall sample. And they sort of continue, and they sort of drop down and go over, uh, over the, as, as time goes on. And this is probably the most uninteresting way to show this data. So. Let's, so let's, let's see if we can find a more interesting way to share it. Well, if we think about, uh, well, how these people end up? About 14, we, we did a, a diagnostic interview uh, at, one, at the one-month assessment, and about 13% of our sample met criteria for PTSD, which is consistent with other samples. It's, again, it's a low base rate occurring situation, a low disorder. But when we look at our severity of PTSD symptoms at one month, this is our uh, PTSD symptom severity score uh, at one month time, we see that there is some variability there. And a likely diagnosis of PTSD corresponds to a score of 33, so right about there. And we could potentially divide this graph up into three groups. Uh, we have the well, people who are very low in symptomology at one month, the people who are sort of in the middle of symptomology at one month, and the people who are very high on, who are higher on symptomology at one month. Um, and this is sort of a helpful way to think about it, because remember, I showed you we looked at the longitudinal course of PTSD over years. It slides around. It's a process that moves around. And so fixating ourselves to who has the diagnosis and doesn't uh, may miss some important information about those who have some symptoms but just don't cross the diagnostic threshold. This way can potentially give us some, some more interesting variability to work with here. So if we take these three categories and sort of see what their symptomology looks like over the course of that uh, first 30-day period using the mobile assessments, we see a figure that looks something like this, which is a little bit more interesting. We see that uh, the people at the top are the ones who had higher symptoms at one month's time, and they almost immediately separate out. Sort of right at the start of, 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 of that first period, they're reporting more elevated symptoms than the other groups. And sort of the middle group stays in the middle, and the low group stays very low. And the, the, so this is kind of interesting, because we, we sometimes think that we have to wait for symptoms to develop. You can't tell if someone's going to have PTSD within the first couple of days. But consistent with some of the other uh, strategies that have used sort of these successive screening processes, we're showing that you might be able to pick up on who's going to have higher symptoms down the line. Also, I want to just point out the y-axis here. This is a 0 to 32-point scale, but this we're capping it here at 10. The symptoms that these folks are experiencing are low. So the person who's going on to have higher symptoms at, uh, down the line is not necessarily having a very strong, stressful, highly aversive reaction. They are uh, just having a sort of presenting a little bit more antsy, maybe having a little feeling, you know, I'm not sleeping too well. I'm thinking about it more often than not. Whereas the person who's going to have very low symptoms at one month is really saying, I am not thinking of it. I am fine. I am completely thinking about this at all. And that's important because I think that as clinicians, we're prone to look for people who uh, are very sort of uh, uh, prolific in their symptoms, who are really talking up what they're going through. And so that may not be the case. The, we, may, we, we might need to be more, more subtle in thinking about who might be at higher at risk. This is with PTSD symptoms. When we look at sleep, we start to see the data get a little bit more muddled, so to speak. Uh, again, across those three groups, uh, this is a zero to four point scale. <laughs> The, the, the people who had low symptoms at one month had some minor sleep problems, but overall were sleeping better than those who were in the middle and higher categories down, uh, down the line. Um, similar stories sort of for pain. Those who uh, were at low had sort of a modest level of pain that sort of declined and stayed low, uh, whereas those who, had higher level, those who had higher levels of symptoms at one month um, were sort of mixed up in the middle and then 
they eventually sort of split out about halfway through that period. But again, you know, not scores of 10 and 9 on the pain scale where they're saying they're in chronic, intense, uh, a very significant pain, just that they're in more pain than, uh, than someone who's saying, I really have very minimal pain. And that's also something to keep in mind, I think. Um, and so we also ask about current concerns. Here's just a prototypical uh, example of someone that was in the high symptomology group and someone that was in the low symptomology group. <clears throat> someone who was in the high symptomology group is complaining about how uh, on day 10 their concern was, I'm not able to help my girlfriend move into her new apartment, my girlfriend's depression, I pull the muscle on my back, my back healing, collecting all the paperwork I need for my divorce. Uh, on the person with the low levels at one month, however, Sleeping without pain, healing fully, sleeping without pain, blankets, looking to my burns, itchiness, getting back to sleep schedule. You can see that the person who is at um, higher levels of symptomology has sort of a range of concerns they're dealing with, some related to their injuries, some not, whereas the person who reported lower levels of symptoms is very focused on their injury. And there might be something interesting there uh, to think about as we go forward from that point, too. So just some conclu preliminary conclusions we can, we can glean from this study and this data, which we are very much still uh, working our way through, is that symptoms do seem to pre be present shortly after the trauma, but at a much lower level. And it sort of leads to this idea of maybe a kindling hypothesis. Are potentially small levels of symptoms early on sort of the snowball that gets rolling that becomes a bigger problem down the line? We don't know, but that might be how we're thinking about this. Um, Pain and sleep are less clear, which are other things that we might be more mindful of after a traumatic injury, but there does seem to be some differences there. Um, and that the groups were separable on PTSD symptoms shortly after the trauma, so it may not be inappropriate to sort of start to check in on these things uh, shortly after the event as opposed to just waiting, which was what we thought we should, was best practices a long time ago. And there are lots more analyses to do with this. Um, we had a number of limitations. You know, the missing data makes it hard for us to do that day-to-day fine-grained changing that we'd love to look at. Uh, data collection really relied a lot on having participants do things. Our survey took only about a minute or so to complete. That's assuming that you just put in a one-word response for that free text answer. Um, but that's still a, a pretty big burden to do that every day. And I and the students that are in my lab can testify to what a burden it is, because I made them all do it for many months on end to make sure the system worked. And it does sort of start to drag on you after a while. Using more passive and sensor-based data collection might be a better way to get through that so that we're not having to have the users do everything. Uh, we can sort of pick up on this information as we go along. And of course, you know, we're, this entire presentation was almost exclusively focused on single incident trauma. And so it's <laughs> unclear how well this is going to generate, uh, or generalize, I should say, to uh, people who have had chronic levels of maltreatment or, or very systematic abuse over the course of their life. Um, those folks, unfortunately, are harder to study. I should say that you know, one of the, the benefits of this particular line of work is that when you work with an injury population, they go to the hospital, and so you can sort of meet them where they're headed. Uh, in other types of trauma, it's not always clear where they're going to end up or if they're ever going to report this or, or report it sort of near the event. And so that becomes, makes it a little difficult, more, more difficult to study. So when I think about what can we learn from this, you know, we might want to think more about how uh, step care might be an important way, uh, way forward. And that if we think that the, if, if this, this idea and this finding that potentially small symptom elevations early on are potentially meaningful for more significant problems down the line, Perhaps we just need to do small little bit of small interventions to start to address those symptoms when they're smaller. Um, and then we can think about ramping up care if it needs to over the course of time. This is a, a publication, a paper that came out uh, last year in JAMA that talked about um, optimization for treating anxiety disorders. Um, and they say that this is sort of what you should do is you should screen patients to see what their anxiety level is on a brief self-report symptom screener. If they have high levels of anxiety, the first thing that we should do as clinicians is say, uh, maybe do some lifestyle changes. Recommend uh, physical activity, mindfulness-based stress reduction, do some brief education around uh, anxiety, about anxiety and stress. Those of us in the room who do behavioral interventions know that uh, telling someone to just change their behavior is far easier said than done, but the idea there being that perhaps we can just make some small recommendations and that might address the anxiety. For those who that seems to be unsuccessful, you should then begin the course of an SSRI or CBT, and then if that seems not to be successful, you should then potentially flip that treatment 
um, or continue to escalate into a more professional care if needed. But this idea that we start small, we see who we can help with small interventions, and then we sort of ratchet our way up might be very useful in this time period um, when people are just experiencing a trauma and they might sort of be developing symptoms, uh, but also very uh, diff have a lot of competing demands. Um, so our next steps are, you know, as I've talked through this kind of entire presentation, uh, one of the things that I've highlighted is the idea that this development of psychopathology seems to be more of a process than so something like a, a, the onset of a virus, where it's not there one day, and then it's there the next day, and then if we get rid of the virus, it's gone the third day. Hopefully, we can treat the virus that quickly. Um, but we're really we're talking more about this sort of process that's unfolding over a period of time. And a lot of the analytic methods that we have used traditionally in the mental health field are not really great at the, doing pattern detection or understanding how process and change occurs over time. Um, some of the interesting ways that uh, computer science has, has been given to us, like neural networks and machine learning, are potentially better at understanding some of these patterns and processes. And using this type of rich data, when we have a lot of measurements per individual, can potentially give us some ways to identify interesting, meaningful patterns that result from individuals <laughs> that are, are neatly separable and we could potentially use to try and understand um, what the symptoms are going to look like down the line. And I have one quick example of this. This was our, our raw scores of pain, again, separated out by PTSD symptom at uh, one month's time. And again, it's sort of muddled. A student who's working in my lab is using something called growth mixture modeling, which is an unsupervised learning technique. And if you apply the same data, uh, you get sort of a different set pattern of results that seems a little bit more separable, a little bit more easily understood, and could potentially be useful in understanding who is at risk for what down the line. Um, so that's sort of where we are with that. I just want to give an abbreviated uh, thank you to the many people in my research lab, the people in the surgery and computer science, as well as the funders who supported this work, uh, and for all of their help in getting these projects done. Um, and lastly, thank you so much. If any of the undergrads in, the office, in, in this presentation or anyone that's interested in getting involved in research, we have a, a lot of computers and not a lot of people sitting there. Um, so please feel free to shoot me an email or look up our work um, if you'd like to know more. Thank you. I do think we have some time for questions. So, yes. Thank you for your presentation. In the uh, studies of uh, populations of uh, people with PTSD, mm -hmm. does the history of pre existing mental health disorders and substance disorders correlate with the severity, progression, and disposition? In other words, does past history influence those three lines? Yes. Oh, so in. Um, we, we, have, we haven't yet looked at that. I would, in prior work, we do know that past trauma history definitely increases your risk for the severity and likelihood of having uh, PTSD symptoms after new traumas. Um, having prior mental health diagnoses it, or pre-existing mental health diagnoses is a very large risk factor. And substance use also, I would say, is also a very large risk factor in that. And we know that folks who have uh, comorbid substance use problems as well as PTSD tend to fare worse um, in their substance use treatment as well as their PTSD treatment and sort of have worse impairment than those who just have one of those conditions alone. So it is, it, those are important things to consider. Just to follow up on that a bit, you know, as you say, uh, there are a lot of pre-existing characteristics mm -hmm. that may predict whether PTSD occurs at all after a traumatic event, possibly over the mm -hmm. Did you assess any problems other than the uh, criterial symptoms of PTSD because, uh, you know, almost all psychopathology uh, is more complex than would be implied by specific sets of DSM criteria. And uh, I'm sure there's a lot of variation among the people you study in the degree of comorbidity. I mean, yeah. comorbidity has you know, become a buzzword to kind of cover the fact that problems are often diverse and quite heterogeneous. And I think PTSD is no exception, even though uh, you have to have had a traumatic event in order to qualify. Mm -hmm. and that makes it in some respects a little more focal than one of the other ones. But then the specific criteria is not assumed to all attempt. Did you yeah. assess other characteristics of compliance and effect in different kinds of interventions uh, on them that you do 
In our, so in our particular study, we did. We did a, we did a full diagnostic interview. We assessed um, other severity scores on other mental health diagnoses. We also um, were able to get access to the medical records. So we have sort of a range of other uh, hospital-based factors, including past diagnoses, as well as a, a comprehensive trauma history. Again, we're sort of in the early phase of looking at this uh, with our data. And so um, we're so, so sorry to sort of get into that. Um, but we do have that information, and we are very much planning to look at that. And I agree with you that these diagnoses are sort of very broad, and, and you know they're sort of helpful. I feel in sort of talking amongst clinicians about this is sort of a rough approximation of what the person's going through. Uh, there's a great paper um, that's titled "626,000 Ways to Have PTSD." As someone just did the number of permutations you can meet criteria for PTSD with all the symptoms, it's roughly over 600,000. So take that for what you will. <laughs> so will you be analyzing these other kinds of problems, the possible outcomes right there? Yes, we will. And one of the other things that I'm also very interested in is just functional impairment. So you know, a lot of times we work with patients and they say, your symptoms have dropped by a certain amount, um, but their lives have drastically improved and they're, they're functioning much better, even though their symptom reduction on these symptom checklists is modest. And so I'm sort of interested in seeing how, do those, how does that also play out. But yes. Yes. Um, well, we, so we do have, again, we have their, their medical record information, and we do know if they were given a sedative. Um, I know that other work that has been done has pointed out that, um, and this is potentially going to be a controversial statement, so I'm going to put a caveat out there before I, before I say that, um, that uh, in observational studies, patients who received a low dose of opioids while in the hospital um, were far less likely to develop PTSD or other anxiety-related conditions after a traumatic event. Now, the level of opioids that they received was a very, very low dose. So it wasn't enough for the patient potentially felt a euphoric high from receiving that, that low dose of opioids. It was, it was used appropriately to curb a very significant amount of pain that was acute pain that was felt at the time of the injury. Um, given our opioid crisis, uh, you know, it's going to be tricky to think about how to proceed smartly with that because we would not want to put out the general note that give people opiates, you present PTSD, and you know, that's what's the, name of the current challenge with that. Um, so we, we will look at that, uh, and there is some evidence to suggest that some things that sort of potentially uh, minimize the stress that's been experienced at the time of the event by a, reducing pain might be potentially helpful. Any other questions? Yes. I think you also have issues here, like thought-provoking and well-presented. It seems like there's a lot of potential for the data-gathering method to be over 600,000. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, one of the, the, the real challenges, I would say, of this type of data collection is the way to be, uh, you, you sort of think, if you come across, you, when, you, when you start thinking about it, you think, we can collect so much information, um, and then you sort of realize that you're going to get almost no compliance if you sort of ask a lot of questions. Um, so we unfortunately did not ask any sort of questions phrased in a, in a post-traumatic growth form where sort of how well are you doing. It was always just, you know, how bad are you, how bad is it, not how good is it. We do have some information um, from the, the free response questions where people sort of gave us some more positive feedback at that point. Um, but I would love to sort of include that in future work with this because that would be helpful. And actually, when we did, um, when we did one of the follow-up questions, one of the follow-up interviews with one, with one participant in the study, um, they said, like, you know, why are you asking all this downer stuff? Uh, we do have one question on social support. We have one survey on social support. And they were like, finally, you're asking me about positive stuff. Gosh, you guys are really, you know, Debbie Downers with this. Um, which sort of bears in mind that, you know, when, when, you, when you focus on sort of the negative, you tend to find the negative. Good question. Yes. Uh, Bernadette, um, your comments on the opiate issue, uh, it's Know, from 30 years where, where that went. Mm -hmm. And I, I worry we're now 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And and the 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 studies that have shown that it seems to be helpful, again, and the, I, I've spoken with the authors, and they are very very emphatic about the dose of opiates given in these observational studies. So this is not people are not randomly being assigned to receive opiates. Um, is well below what would be considered a um, a dose that would put someone at risk for addiction or someone that would someone be. be uh, it, but make someone feel a euphoric high. It was, it's a very low dose. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, so I have a, a reaction and a question. Mm -hmm. it, and I think, like, some of the other questions I was hearing is that, you know, in the first four days, you sort of differentiate these groups. Mm -hmm. So, yes, so my mind goes to maybe there's a few more big condition that would separate yeah. them from the get go, right? Yeah. To use your analogy of the virus. Well, you know, people have different, uh, you know, defenses against that virus, mm -hmm. right? Some people catch it and develop the, 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 the illness and others don't. And so I, I think that given all the rich data you have, that's really very interesting to, to, to see that line of research. Um, the, the question is, it's, it's maybe boring, but the missing data, I might mean, just play with that, but is there any meaning to how many, you know, different participants might differ to the extent to which they have missing data? Yes. Does the missing data itself have some meaning of how frequently you miss respondents in terms of that's a good question. You know, it's something we're, we're looking into. We, we um, in in the prior work we've done, uh, we found that those who responded more uh, had higher levels of symptoms down the line, and so. Uh, when I shared that with someone, they said, oh, so you gave them more PTSD by having them do this. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it works that way. Um, but it might be indicative of that those, you know, it's one of those things where it might be the people that uh, were sort of uh, on their way to having more significant problems latched onto this as a potential support mechanism. Um, it may be also those who were developing more symptoms just were dealing with a lot and gave up on it. Um, the benefit, I would say, is that because the period is so long, it's a, it's a longer period of 30 days, uh, most people sort of pop back in and out. Um, we sort of see a sort of a steep decline, I would say, after about day 20, um, and I think that people just sort of get <coughs> fed up with doing it. But, you know, it's worthwhile to look into that as well. I mean, we, we do plan to, we should say. Yes. Yes. Oh, that was, um, so the, the Israel study was specifically about treating PTSD sort of shortly after a trauma. That later slide was a, a recent treatment recommendations for anxiety in general. So if you have a patient coming in with, with an anxiety disorder, uh, SSRIs may be very helpful in that scenario. So good clarification. Yes. Uh, this is going to be slightly this in my mind was the statement that opiate um, administration early yeah. does that and I've always thought of opiates 
as, as truly, it's, it's an emotional adjuster. Uh, I, I'm not aware that it intervenes in what receptive responses at the peripheral level. So uh, it's like laughing gas was, you know, was described to me by Professor Mary way back. Uh, it hurts like hell, but it's wonderful. <laughs> having an effect, it could be that it's an intervention to make the event in itself, the experience of which may result in symptoms as we go on, uh, to reinterpret that in such a way as to be, I can deal with this, I have this under control. Mm -hmm. I wonder that an early <coughs> intervention consisting of producing clarity as this is what we find, this is what's busted, this is how we fix it, this is how long it's going to take. This is how much it's going to cost you. <laughs> and this is how we're going to work with you for payments. So the future is laid out and it's under control mm -hmm. uh, as a means, as a version of an opiate mm -hmm. uh, to bring the, uh, yeah. you may be familiar with the, the experiments that's run on the, the boat of the brain cells between I can't control it and I can't downstream effects on the you know, dopamine mm -hmm. release, for example, mm -hmm. with neurotypical um, functions. Uh, I wonder if you might ever be interested in doing research just like you did it. Yeah, so I would say I would say yes to that. And I the um the exposure-based intervention, the early exposure-based intervention sort of came from um, a series of basic learning studies in which they showed that if you were able to do, uh, in animal models, if you were able to use um, and ex expose the animal to a, 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 a now conditioned stimulus, sort of immediately after learning took place, uh, you were able to sort of eliminate that learning um, that this, this, this stimulus was fearful. And so that was sort of then extrapolated out to see if it could be done in humans. Um, I think the challenging is that, you know, in a tightly controlled animal situation, a laboratory, you can very easily sort of make sure that the exposure is happening almost immediately after um, the, the, the conditioning part happens. In the, in, in the human world, there's a lot of stuff that takes place in between, for example, a time that a person's in a car accident to when you're able to meet with them in a hospital uh, because there's ambulance rides, there's a lot of other stuff that's going on, um, and it can be tricky to do. And so I think that potentially is why the effects are smaller. I think that to your other point, though, that like the collaborative care model, which is trying to sort of help individuals problem solve and give them coping strategies and, and ways to sort of deal with the stressors that they're encountering moment by moment, uh, I think that some of its magic might be in the fact that it is helping people realize that they can deal with and, and, and they can handle these the stressors that are being given to them, and they have a person that's helping them with that. Yeah. One last question? Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so this is a, this is a good question. Um, it was not planted, by the way, but it was a good question. <laughs> um, of the idea of that, do we sort of potentially change what we're measuring by measuring it? If, we, if, 
there's, there's, some, there's some literature that suggests that repeated assessments can be helpful for a small subset of individuals with PTSD. Largely, the thinking is, is that they sort of are become aware, oh, this is a problem, and then they're able to do some self-correcting. Um, and I think that is uh, definitely the case. As a scientist, I would say it's an unfortunate scenario that's sort of unavoidable um, because we're sort of, again, changing what we're measuring because we're measuring it. As a clinician, though, it makes me excited because, as I mentioned, sort of one of the things that I think could be potentially helpful is doing small, easily disseminated interventions. And if just checking in with people automatically on their phone seems to have some clinical utility, uh, you know, that is a very easy intervention to put out there. And if that has any clinical utility, that can be very powerful and very useful early on. So are we better? Okay, I think we're about out of time. I'm happy, though, to hang out and, and answer other questions if people want to come up.